feedback systems. We saw, we went through the analysis based on the uh, return ratio. We saw that you can calculate, you can calculate the asymptotic transfer function by looking at one source, a dependent, dependent, an independent source in the forward path. You set it to infinity, you make it very large, basically by scaling it by factor k, and then you see what the asymptotic transfer function is, h infinity, and then you saw that there are two correction factors that are determined by, one is determined by the return ratio t, and the other one is determined by the direct forward transfer. So that those two, and then combined together, we had an equation that consisted of these three, three terms and gave you the exact transfer function, which was the asymptotic form asymptotic transfer uh, form, uh, function or asymptotic gain formula. And that's due to Middlebrook, sometimes people call it Middlebrook formula. And then you took that, and then you took the same representation and said, well, okay, well, how about the impedances, input and output impedances? And we looked at it, it's a black equation, which basically told you that you can determine the, any, the impedance of any port by looking at, choosing a, a reference source and setting it to, nulling it, basically scaling it by k equals zero, and then seeing what the impedance is, and you, you are, in this case, you typically pick a source which is in the feedback path and disable the feedback, to make your life easier, so you determine the impedance seen without feedback, essentially, and then you have to determine two return ratios. You, you short that port to determine the return ratio, and you open that port, and you determine the return ratio, and that <coughs> open that z naught is scaled by one plus t short over one over t, one plus t open. So we saw all of these things. You can do a lot based on return ratio, and uh, it's quite a powerful tool. There is, there are some problems with return ratio. We alluded to some of them. Let's quickly go over some of them quickly. Number one is that return ratio we saw is not, in, even in a single loop, even when you have like a single feedback loop, the return ratio is not an invariant of the loop. Basically, depending on where you can measure it, you can, you can get a different result. Now, as long as you reference everything to that same source, every, the final result will be correct, but you have different values for return ratio, so it's not an invariant property. Another problem is more of a practical problem when you try to do this, particularly if you're trying to use a simulator to determine the return ratio, is that a lot of times your dependent sources are part of the transistor model. And a lot of times you have compact transistor models where you don't have direct access to it. Now, for a return ratio to work, what you really need to do is that if you have, for instance, a, let's say, a GM source somewhere, and you need to have your independent source right there. This is your IC, which gives you IX and IY. And before any other parasitic elements. But a lot of times these are incorporated into the model. So you, you may have a capacitor here or something like that attached to this. And this is going to damage it because you really need to be right before it connects to anything else to be able to do that. So if you are, if you are a person writing the simulator yourself, of course you can incorporate this stuff into it. That would be easy. But if you don't have access to the in, internal parts of the model, then sometimes it can be confusing. And you have to be careful because you may try to simulate and say, well, it doesn't work quite well because you're really ignoring these things. You have to really be sitting right there before any of these things are connected. So you have to be really sitting like that for a turn ratio to work. So that's another challenge. I mean, it's, it's a practical challenge. Uh, but nonetheless, it's something that you have to be aware of. Now, because of all of these things, and because of these limitations of return ratio, uh, we need to, we were, we were looking, we are looking for another quantity. We are looking for something which we call, now we call it looping. And this quantity we would like to be, at least in a single loop, to be an in, invariant of the loop, in the sense that no matter where you look at it, it should be the same. So, let's start from the very abstract picture of a feedback system. So, in a, the most abstract form of a feedback system, you have a block diagram picture like this, right? This is what you see in the system representation, control theory kind of models. Okay. And we'll see what the limitations of this are. So you have some sort of a UI, you have a UO, so, and these are like not all digital cards, these are like mathematical quantities. And the inputs and outputs of these things are ideal, idealized signals. So now if you break this loop in the absence of an input, so if you basically set UI to zero, and break this loop at different places, so basically you are cutting it, so they show it like that, like two scissors, and you basically apply, let's say, some idealized source, uh, signal. Let's not even show it as a source. So let's say you apply a ux here in the absence of ui. What, what comes back on the other side? So if you have ux here, this would be fux. This would be minus fux because this is a minus sign. Minus fux, minus a fux. So what you get is ui would be minus a f. UX. So the signal, having gone around the loop, come back, and having come back, has experienced a gain of minus AF. And that's what is often 
that's what the new game should be. But they have to be careful. In fact, almost universally, people refer to the negative of this quantity as the loop game. Although, I mean, it does, it's a little bit confusing because you really are eliminating it. But since everyone is doing it, basically, uh, to avoid confusion later on with everything else that we read everywhere else, we will define it that way. So we define the loop game as the negative of ui over ux, which is in this case going to be af. So, but keep in mind, af is not just the game, it's the negative of the game, the signal experience is when it comes back. That's why when you have, for instance, when you talk about stability, we see that if you have 180 degrees of phase shift around them, we have a problem. Because there's another 180 degrees due to this guy, which gives you 360 degrees, so you, the signal comes back in phase and you could have a problem. And we'll see when, when you do or do not have a problem later on when we talk about this. But net numbers, so keep in mind, whenever we refer to loop game, we're really talking about the negative of the return quantity. The, and this is universal, almost like everyone does it. Except for very old books where they refer to this quantity as a loop game. Everyone else refers to this one as a loop game. It's the negative of the loop game, really. But this is a loop, what we call loop game. Anyway, so you understand there's a wireless sign. Okay. 
some sort of a, the output of the amplifier has some sort of a source impedance, C2, and then the input of this guy, feedback, and let's assume unilateral for this time. So in other words, we're assuming that both of them are unilateral. So you're thinking about a unilateral loop. In other words, the signal can travel only in this direction, in the, in the, full, in the amplifier, and in this direction, from right to left, in the feedback path. So, and this is what, so this is a more realistic representation of a kind of circuit. Again, it's unilateral, so it's limited, and no circuit really is unilateral, we'll talk about it bilateral later. But, so this is what you'll have. So, if, if I wanted to break this loop and see what's coming back, how's it related to what's going in, if I just simply break it this way, would I get a correct result by applying, let's say, a voltage? No, because what I've done is that I've removed the load the loading of this guy, right? So if I were to do this correct, I mean, to take this into account, the loading, again, this is not the way we'll finally do it. I'm just showing you an intermediate step. I'm just basically trying to arrive at the result as an epic. It's an intermediate step. So what, what do I need to do if I want to take this into account? I have to put the equivalent impedance seen by this guy here, right? So I have to put another copy of C4 here and apply maybe a text voltage or a test or a test current and see what comes back. So let's say I apply a test voltage Vx and look at Vy. So if I were to do that, then I basically can capture this correct. Or if I wanted to do it with currents, I could do the same thing. I could basically say, look, you know, I can apply a current here and see what kind of current comes back. If I have a, some sort of, what kind of current goes here. So instead of doing it this way, I could replace this part with something that looks like this. Z4. And I could apply a test current source, for instance, Ix, and see what would go through this other replica Z4 that I've placed here to capture the effect of loading. This would be IY. That could be one of these two pictures. And either one of them would give it a, a loop game kind of thing. Right? So, if you were to do something like this, this is fine, we can do it. And the question is, what is that in the general case? So, in the general case, you can think about this as a, as a two-port network, and this is another two-port network. So again, I'm going through a derivation <coughs> really, of something that will be useful and we'll use later. So the way we think about this two-port is that we can think about a two-port in general here. So you can have a Y1 here. And let's assume it's unilateral for now. You have a <coughs> G2DI, where this is VI. Yeah. 
and this would be my dy. So the question is, what is the looping? The way we thought about it. There. So we can do the calculation. It's relatively easy. So if this is vx, this is basically v over. This becomes vx. Right? So what is the KCL at the input? So the KCL at the input is that g3 vx, which is this current, is equal to the current through these two guys in parallel, which is y1 plus y3 vi, 0, and then, then we call this yi. And then another one, again, on the output here, so we basically have a g2 vi is um, y2 plus y4 vy. Zero, and we call this yo. <coughs> and if you look at these two, you can easily see that there are four with the loop game, which I have to really show as a tf, because this is going in this direction. But whenever I drop the subscript f, if there's no subscript, basically it's implicit that it's forward. If there's a subscript f, it means that you have to also worry about the r, the reverse. So for now, we are talking about a unilateral loop, so we are only worried about tf, so you just show it as t. So t, basically, if you solve for it, which is defined as minus vy over vx, if you want to want to solve for this, <coughs> we see it's g2, g3 over yi. I, Y, over I, X, but when V, X, V, Y is zero. 
named sugar. So I find two new quantities. And I want to determine these two quantities in this paper, the same framework, and see how they are related, or if they are related to this new loop, to this original loop. So let's calculate the Vx. It's actually easier to calculate. Can I make this? 
I don't worry about the voltage, I just apply something, one time it's open, apply voltage, measure the voltage on the other end, it's open, apply current, measure the current on the other side, it's short. So, can I write this in terms of these two? Well, if you invert both of them, this is the one over each one of them, and add them, what do you get? So, let's, let's see. So, I'm saying 1 over T is minus YI, YO over G2, G3. And what is 1 over TV? It's minus YI, Y2, G2, G3. I'm creating a common denominator, basically. 1 over TI is minus Y, I, Y4, G2, G3. What is the sum of these two? It's Y, I times Y2 plus Y4, right? But what is Y2 plus Y4? <coughs> y, O. So, from all of this comes out the following, which is what you need to remember, not that details are big. What you need to remember is that the unilateral loop gain, the forward loop gain, is equal to the 1 over the voltage loop gain plus 1 over the current loop gain. So it's like parallel resistance in a sense. So if you are if you don't want to worry about the loading and calculating what the loading and everything is, no problem. All you need to do is just to calculate two loop gates, the voltage loop gate and the current loop gate. And calculate the sum of the reciprocals, and that would be one over your forward loop. So this is the useful result. This is bad for unilateral, by the way. So this is what you need to remember, which is not that hard to remember. But now, how do I apply this? How do I use this? Right? So that's the important thing. So the derivation doesn't really matter once you see it. But it comes from. So let's look at examples. Let's look at, I'm going to show you one of the examples that you've seen before, but now let's capture the loop game. So you've seen this stage before, right? You've seen this. So you have an R3. And you can do it for anything you want. Out R two R one D N. Okay. So I'm trying to determine the low frequency loop gain at this point, at least for this unilateral. And for at low frequency, this is unilateral. Basically. And we'll see the bilateral in a few minutes. So what do I do? Where do I break the loop? The good thing is that if I am within a single loop, it doesn't matter. And there's a single loop here, so I can break it in different places. Let's break it in different places and see So let's break it here first. And do calculate the voltage and current loop gates. So to, to calculate the voltage loop gate, what do I do? I apply a Vx and measure Vy. Right? So let's do that. If this is Vx, what is this voltage? Or what is this current? This the small signal model. Which is small signal current. GM2 VX. Which is basically the same as this current. Right. Now this current gets current divided between what? This resistor and what here? And this is in the absence of an input, basically. This is when the input is not. And what? So it's current divided between R1 and R1. So the current divide, so I have basically Vx, I have a GM2, this current is coming this way, and this current therefore is R1 divided by R1 plus Rm1, which is this current going in this direction, which would be this current, which multiplies by R3 to give me uh, this voltage with a minus sign. But my loop gain, by definition, has a minus sign. So this is Vy in terms of Vx. So my voltage loop gain is Gm2R3 um, R1 over R2 plus Rm1, which you can, if you are interested, you can uh, multiply and divide this part by Rm1. So basically you get GM1, GM2, 
over GM. So the common terms among them, I'm going to factor it, obviously, for right? GM2R3. Let's factor. From this, I will have 1 over GM1R1, and from the other one, I will have 1. Right? So it's this, so, and this is basically another way of writing 1 plus GM1R1. So 1 over that.
seems like you can choose your point so that when the bum becomes infinity, that way it's easier to calculate. Exactly. So that's a very good point. He says, if you choose, so it seems that if you pick the right points, your life becomes easier. Now, depending on who you talk to, the question is, which one is easier? Is this easier or that easier? It's up to you. The good thing is that you have the choice. So now, this actually resolves this question, because a lot of times, you see in places, in you know, books or some textbooks or something like that, people break the roof. Well, you have to break it at this point, though. Let's break the roof at this point. They usually pick the points where the current roof gate is infinity. Like these. They go after points like that. But you don't have to. And some and practice, particularly when you think about the high frequency stuff, there exists no point like that. Because if you think about high frequency stuff, then you have to take this capacitance into account. If you have this capacitance, even when you when you put current here, there will be some current going through here. So there will be some finite voltage determined by the impedance of that capacitance times that current. So that only works for low frequency, some special points, MOSFETs. That's what it works for. But this works for everything. At least as long as you have a unilateral, unilateral system. And then we'll see what happens, what's the, how the equation is modified. by. There will be a correction term, there will be a third term when you have bilateral. And a lot of times that term is very small. So this is a very good approximation anyway. But if you want to know what it is exactly, then we'll do it exactly. Any other questions about this? Do you have like specific applications for TI and TV? Applications? Yeah. Uh, you mean what they are? No, just like what they do. There's so a, it's a measure of how much of the current is returned and how much of the voltage is returned, right? So think about it. If you have a high impedance node, it means that at that node, you get a lot of current you 